Microplastics are everywhere, in our water, cleaning supplies, and in so many of our everyday household essentials. This week's guest is on a mission to help us cut out microplastics and reduce the amount of single-use plastics we use once and for all. You're listening to Found, the TechCrunch podcast that brings you the stories behind the startups. Today, we're talking to Sarah Paiji Yu, the CEO and co-founder of Blueland, a company that creates eco-friendly and plastic-free cleaning supplies. I'm Dominic Midori Davis, and here to talk about whether or not there is plastic in my brain is our special guest host, Tim Deshant, and I'm excited to be here. Thanks, Dom. It's good to be chatting with you about this topic, something I'm definitely interested in. Yeah, great to have you. All right. Now, before we get into the conversation, we have two truths and a lie. At the end of the episode, we'll review which is the lie. So number one, in the early days of development, Sarah and her co-founder went to candy manufacturers to see if they'd be able to manufacture their tablets. Number two, the plan was originally to launch in stores, but they spent three years direct to consumer instead. Number three, Sarah was inspired by the female founders coming out of Harvard Business School at the time. Yes, it seems like based off of those stats alone, we're going to have a pretty exciting episode. So listen carefully to see which one of those is a lie. You'll find out, of course, at the end of the episode. And before we begin, please remember to rate and review to let us know that you are loving these amazing guests and our amazing podcasts. Hey, Sarah, welcome to Found. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, I guess the easiest way to start off is, can you tell us a little bit about Blue Land? Yeah, so Blue Land, we are a five-year-old brand. We launched in 2019, and we are reimagining cleaning products to eliminate single-use plastic packaging. So when we first launched back in 2019, we launched with a set of cleaning sprays and foaming hand soap products that are typically up to 90% water and come in a new plastic bottle each time. So what we did is we invented the refill tablet. So a dry refill tablet, which enabled us to package that in paper instead of plastic. And we went into the market encouraging people to either reuse bottles that they already have or to use one of our forever reusable bottles. And since then, we've launched into, I guess, a range of categories from dishwasher to laundry to toilet and even body wash and face wash, again, all with the goal of eliminating single-use plastic and with the promise of of no single-use plastic in any of our products. And what got you interested in this area? You know, my journey to founding Blue Land really started when I became a new mom seven years ago. I was doing a ton of research on not just like what formula I would use, but the water quality of the water that I had used to mix with my son's baby formula. And so, you know, I had very basic questions like, how clean is New York City tap water? And would I be better off using bottled water? And I was pretty horrified in that research to learn that regardless, tap water or bottled water here in the U.S., drinking water contains thousands of pieces of microplastics per liter. And it was unfortunately not until that point in time that I really start to connect the dots between all the single-use plastic that we're using as a society, how it's ending up in our oceans and our waterways and breaking down into tiny pieces of microplastic that are too small to effectively filter out. And now it's showing back up and pervasive in our drinking water and the food we eat and in you know the formula that I was making my son. And so that just initially really just prompted me to really want to do my part and my family's part. And so we try to cut out all single-use plastic from our family's home life. I actually went all the way and I took my family zero waste for two years. And this is with, you know, a, a newborn at That's home. That's hard. So it was, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, I mean, we did the whole, we did cloth diapers. We did the whole nine yards, but and it, you know, it was a really eye-opening experience because as well-intentioned as we were, it still felt impossible to really avoid single-use plastic, like everything, not just cleaning products, but ketchup, vitamins, medication, Tooth, everything seemed to come packaged in single-use plastic. And so, yeah, that's when, you know, I was doing all this work to maintain a zero-waste lifestyle. And, you know, it wasn't lost on me that there was probably a better way to have more impact and give other consumers more and and better choices without single-use plastic. Yeah, well, first of all, I have two follow-ups. The first of which, how clean is New York City drinking water? Because it's supposed to be really clean. But what what did you find? Yeah. So, I mean, I was, I stand by tap water. We still drink tap water at home for sure. I think from a microplastics perspective, it's just hard, right? I think, you know, you have the microplastics and then you have nanoplastics as well. So, you know, the thing with plastic is that it doesn't just disappear. It's not readily biodegradable. It just keeps breaking down into smaller and smaller pieces. And increasingly research is coming out that 
you may be inclined to think the smaller, the better, but actually with plastics, the smaller they are, the more dangerous they can be because now nanoplastics are being shown to be able to cross cell membranes, cross the blood brain barrier and the small nature of them also just make them impossible, frankly, to filter out effectively. Certainly there's significantly more microplastics in bottled water and that's why I stand by tap. But, you know, we're just unfortunately in a situation where this proliferation of plastic has left us in a place where there's just there's microplastic exposure everywhere. Yeah. I mean, the second thing I was going to bring up was that study about how microplastics are crossing the brain barrier and all these things. And I'm like, oh, that's, you know, well, what can you do about that? Yeah, <laughs> no, I know. I think that's it's hard. I mean, I'm grateful that the research is now starting to come out because I think for a long time, big industry has relied on like not having concrete linkages on microplastic consumption or in plastic exposure to impacts on health. As you can imagine, those are really hard studies to do given we all have so much microplastic exposure and you can't just assign a group of people to ingest an order amount of plastic, but that research is coming out. So yeah, recently, you know, nanoplastics has been linked to Parkinson's. Another study recently came out this year also linking microplastics to heart attacks and strokes. And so I truly believe that that's really just the tip of the iceberg. And unfortunately, there are more studies to come. I was going to say, along those lines, have you seen every time one of these new studies comes out, have you seen an uptick in sales, adoption, interest? I can't say that we've seen sort of like a very clear one-to-one correlation. I do absolutely believe that Blue Land as a business has been the beneficiary of a lot of momentum because of just the increased public awareness and media and social media interest in plastic, microplastics, and climate. More broadly, I've certainly really felt that shift over the past five years. I feel like when we first launched Blue Land in 2019, we were spending most of our time just trying to explain the why, like why people should care and the fact that this plastic was breaking down and that This plastic was being found in our water, in our blood, in our placenta, in our brains. Versus now, I think because there's been so much coverage of it over the past few years in interest, we can skip the why, you know, largely and kind of move to the what and the how, which has been really helpful. I I don't think a brand like Blue Land would have been able to do what it's done had we launched, you know, 10 to 15, 20 years ago. I think timing is is really important of the journey that we've been on. Yeah, when I was going to say 10, 15 years ago, I don't think there was quite the science to back this up. I don't think we had the detection methods to find micro and now even nanoplastics everywhere. And just people's thinking, I think, around plastics, right? Biodegradable used to be a good thing, right? They break down in the environment. Now maybe we're starting to realize that's not such a great thing. And it's in part due to like these research efforts and the detection methods. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So how much of the evolving science on this is helping you to, I guess, understand your ingredients and the marketing behind them and stuff like that so that you can, I guess, vet the products that you are procuring and then selling to your customers? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, the evolving science has absolutely been critical to informing sort of where we focus our innovation and sort of product development, as well as positioning and messaging. You know, a good example of that is when we got started, we thought the plastic that we were eliminating was primarily like the packaging, right? So like the plastic bottles, or in the case of laundry, like the plastic jugs that liquid comes in or the plastic tubs that pods come in. Like I mentioned, we started with cleaning sprays and hand soap. We always knew that laundry was a category that would make sense for us to enter at some point, having started in cleaning more broadly. And when we went down the laundry path, we thought that, again, what we were displacing were jugs and tubs. Pretty early in that process, as we were starting to talk to a lot of manufacturers in the space, we realized, I guess to our horror, that that film that individually wraps each pot, that that's actually a plastic as well. It's, it's a plastic It's a petroleum-based plastic called polyvinyl alcohol. It does not readily biodegrade. And for us, it was extra concerning versus a jug or a tub, which, you know, most consumers will either know to recycle or sort of worst case scenario, it'll go into their trash can to a landfill versus these plastic pods are designed to go down our drains into our water systems, which, you know, ultimately then release into oceans, rivers, and the environment. At the same time, there was another rising category of format within laundry of laundry sheets, which we learned also are made of polyvinyl alcohol. Again, the same plastic that's used in all pods. And so I think 
when we discovered that, it just unlocked a whole other sort of dimension to our mission. I mean, pods is the dominant category in the dishwasher category. 60% plus of dishwasher detergent comes in pods. It's also a dominant share of laundry. So an estimated 20 billion plastic pods are going down our drains each year in the U.S. alone. So obviously we decided to not make pods you know, we did want to continue with a single dose format because it's a format that continues to take share because of the convenience. And so we're very proud to be sort of the first to bring to market a true naked tablet that you can use like a pod or like a sheet. It's single dose, but without any any of the plastic. Why did the laundry industry settle on pods? Because I'm trying to remember, like I remember growing up, I feel like it was like a powder. And then like 10 years ago, it was like all about the pods. So what happened that I guess the industry thought that originally these plastic pods would be good or like a better alternative? Yeah. So I think, you know, with a lot of legacy brands in these large existing categories, like innovation is a way to continue to drive more sales, oftentimes also a way to move up into higher priced, higher margin products by delivering some sort of consumer benefit. And with pods, it really was a convenience factor. You know, I agree with you. I mean, I think forever we've had really great formats that didn't contribute to microplastic pollution in the form of powder and liquid. I continue to be a big proponent of both. But the pods, what they delivered was that there was no messy pouring or getting powder everywhere or the sticky liquid, I think, for folks that are then, you know, doing their laundry to laundromat or students that are, you know, going down to like a shared space or people that live in apartment buildings. There was a convenience that pods delivered. And thus, you know, I think pods continue to be able to command a higher price point per dose. But then when you think about like why it had to be plastic, when you step back, like it actually makes a lot of sense. Because I think a lot of people are surprised. They're like, oh, I thought that just disappeared. It just, I thought maybe it's like sugar-based or something, which yeah, I see the nodding. But then if you step back and think about how harsh those pods... I mean, we all know pods have killed children. They've been ingested. Like That's how harsh the chemicals are that are contained within a pod. So to think that like a sugar wrapper could then effectively keep that liquid in place is unrealistic. Then when you step back, you're like, of course it's plastic. Like what else could it be that could then house something that's that strong of a liquid? Yeah, I know. I have the, my friend bought me some pods and every time I, I just did a load today and I was like, I wonder where this thing goes. Is it, like it just disappears. And then I'm like, oh, this is probably not good for me. No, but, yeah. oh gosh. but I mean, yeah, going back to the research, I mean, that's, you know, the research that came out in 2021 was that, you know, what happens to that plastic, right? Cause you can maybe then say, Hey, look, it goes down our water systems, which then goes to a wastewater treatment facility. And maybe it's effectively dealt with in that wastewater treatment facility. And it's, you know, 100% degraded there. The results of the study was that 75% of those intact plastic particles were ultimately then being released from a wastewater treatment facility into the environment. So about 25% of it was being degraded, but again, the clear majority of it was then being released into our environment. And, you know, other studies that also come out since then, polyvinyl alcohol has been found in drinking water. It's been found in human breast milk. It's been found in, you know, multiple different bodies of, of water and oceans across the globe. It's been found in fish. And I think this research is important because before you had that research, you really didn't have a fact base. And, you know, it was just kind of a question and a wondering of like, what happens to this? And maybe it goes away. Yeah. Maybe I'm asking an obvious question here, but what are the dangers in letting that loose into the environment? Yeah. So I would say that the point that we are at right now with polyvinyl alcohol is we're not at a point where there are studies that can link like polyvinyl alcohol as a microplastic leads to cancer. And obviously that is what you know a lot of especially consumers want. Right now, though, there are studies, so for example, with polyvinyl alcohol, when fish have been exposed to it. And you, sometimes you'll find these studies with plastic are done with with like grass or with fish, because these are unfortunately things that are easier to expose to microplastics without as many of the questions around ethics. But with fish exposed to polyvinyl specifically, they found that it did inhibit growth rates as well as metabolism and susceptibility to infections. And so, you know, there are linkages that are being made between plastics and health and between specifically polyvinyl alcohol. That's crazy. So it's not necessarily just 
because I know with other plastics, they can kind of be carriers for things like heavy metals and stuff like that. But in this case, it almost sounds like they're becoming mimics for stuff that's naturally occurring within our body and disrupting those internal processes. It's a great point. And I don't know that we've been able to separate the two. I think that's where, you know, my view has been like outside of the studies, the reason why microplastics is so concerning is that we know that plastics, right, have the ability to adsorb other harmful contaminants, heavy toxic metals, bacteria, viruses, and act as carriers for these things up our food chain, like into other places, like outside of the question of like, how harmful is virgin plastic? I think the other thing to consider is that microplastics are plastics that's oftentimes like PVA exposed to wastewater and then the natural environment where it's then picking up all types of other things and then, you know, acting as carriers. And so I think with the fish study specifically, it's hard to know how much of it is inherent with the plastic or is it carrying other things, but either way, it's just, it's it's not good news in my opinion. (laughs) And shifting a little bit to Blue Land, what were the early days of the company like? Because I imagine, I mean, it's this really big topic, all of this research, and you have a goal. What are the early days of, like, execution? Absolutely wild. I think it was probably a good thing that we had no idea how long and hard of a journey it was going to be. I think, I mean, early days, we got a taste of it because the number of no's we heard from whether it was industry veterans like Beak, CPG, or, you know, manufacturers in the space of like how this was going to be impossible to do, that there was a reason that it had never been done, right? Both from a formulation perspective, but also from a commercialization perspective, like all the reasons why this was going to be too big of a change to actually execute. And also just a lot of questions around like, do people actually care about the environment or ultimately are people selfish and self-serving and, you know, they care a bit less about what they're putting into the environment. But from a creating the product perspective, like we truly did something that had never been done before. Like you take our hand soap tablet, not only had like a hand soap tablet never existed, a hand soap concentrate of any kind where you add water to make your own liquid hand soap or foaming hand soap, like that had never existed anywhere in the world. And so that was, you know, close to two years of a pretty heavy development. And this is where initially we went to contract manufacturers because that's typically the first place to start when you have like an idea and you're starting a company in a space. Usually there are manufacturers that can make the product for you. You know, we went to over a dozen cleaning products manufacturers. They all looked at us like we had three heads and like quite condescendingly explained like, we make liquid products. We don't even own tablet machinery. In fact, most of our ingredients come to us as liquid. So, you know, you're going to have to formulate your own products. And, you know, I'm not a chemist. My co-founder is also not a chemist. And we didn't even have chemists in our friend groups or networks. And so it really was just starting from like, we just went on LinkedIn and just started looking and pinging chemists and just trying to get anyone that would talk to us, trying to get people on the phone to see like who could just kind of point us in the right direction. At the same time, we started talking to so many candy manufacturers because we wanted to then talk to people that could make like dry format products to see if they can make cleaning products tablets for us. The answer was no, they, they can't. <laughs> the smarties people didn't want in on this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. For a range of really good reasons. But, you know, I think definitely the first, you know, six months was just like, felt like it was just grasping around in the dark, <laughs> um, just trying to latch onto something and, and find a path forward. And that's ultimately how we found our chief innovation officer, you know, he, we found him on LinkedIn. He had like the perfect background of, he had decades of cleaning products experience. And he was at that point, head of formulation. He was a director of formulation at Method. And then prior to that, he had extensive experience in probiotics and nutritional supplements, working on products like Culturel. And so he had this like Venn diagram of like tablet experience and like cleaning products experience. I feel like he was like the unicorn. And we just, I just kept reaching out to him via LinkedIn, was guessing his email address until he responded. It was creepy. I mean, I was made up reasons to be in San Francisco, which is where he was. So I could like meet up with him in person. Once we even intercepted him in Chicago, because he had to go to Chicago for a work trip. And I was like, I'm going to be in Chicago. Um, and, and that's kind of how we chipped away at him and eventually convinced him to join us as our first hire. 
Before you found him, were there ever moments where you're like, this is never going to work? Before, even after we found him, there were so many moments where we thought like, this is never going to work. I mean, at so many levels, right? Because it's the product formulation is one bit, right? Knowing that with cleaning, the most important thing is it needs to be effective. We also know that like changing behavior is really hard, which kind of then shifts to like driving a new format and new behavior in a massive industry, it's a hundred billion dollar industry and how much money that should in theory take to educate and market a product like that. So I think there are many levels, but even during the process, like even, you know, once we had a template that would dissolve and was very effective at cleaning, we then realized like, oh my goodness, like we're going to need a very effective kill system and preserve system. Like you need a strong preservative, but obviously for us, everything needs to be green and biodegradable. But the issue that we were facing is people are making their own products. So like I might've just changed my son's diaper and then like been inspired to make multi-surface cleaner and not wash my hands and go drop a tablet into a, a full bottle of water. And then that could sit under my sink and I could forget about it for two years. Something will grow within a week to two weeks. Something will absolutely grow, whether you see it or not. In two years, you will absolutely see growth of something in there. So you need, again, something to clean the water. Also, water quality varies dramatically across the U.S. So you need a kill system, again, and then a preserve system, which is really hard to do in a green way. But then also when when we're faced with that challenge, there's no way to do it in a dry. All of the pathways were liquid. And so there were many levels of, even at that point, I was like, oh my God, like we can't move forward. We were probably stuck in that flying formation for months where we didn't think there was a way forward. And I wasn't going to put something out there that wasn't biodegradable or truly green, but we certainly weren't going to put something out there. And there are copycats on the market where first thing we like look at the ingredients, we're like, oh my God, there's no preservative in here. And that is very dangerous. But yeah, lots, lots of examples of stories like that where we thought we had hit, we had hit the wall. I just had a real quick follow-up question. Was there a moment where it felt like it all coalesced and you knew it was going to work? <laughs> I wish. Um, maybe the only moment was probably like the clearest signal I had, even though it wasn't like so clear to drive the confidence of like slam dunk, like you know, the, the road is clear and it's just, just up and out from here is on the other side of launch. I think, you know, the way that we felt up to launching is it really felt like a black box of, is there going to be interest? Is this going to work? Because as much as, you know, in the lean startup space, you know, there's a lot of what I ascribe to of like iterating, testing, failing fast. I think a lot of those methods serve themselves better for SaaS or B2B type businesses. I think when you're trying to build a consumer product brand, you can't just throw up a quick and dirty website with like wireframes of what a product would look like and then have the conversion metrics that you're calculating really be reflect. I think you need the full brand out there. I think you need social out there. You think you need some amount of press out there to provide credibility to really be able to get a sense of like, can this have legs? And so you know, we didn't get that until on the other side of launch. And I think we certainly did a lot better that first month than we expected. And so I think that's when we felt like it wasn't like a click it's working, but I think it was more of like a sigh of relief of like, if not entirely broken and there might be, there might be something, something there. Now you didn't launch directly into retailers, right? No, no, we, so we did not. I, was very adamant out the gates from the beginning. We like our stake in the ground was like first three years direct to consumer. I think we really came from a place of recognizing like new format, new behavior. I think there are certainly different types of founders out there. I think you have the types of founders that are like, I have a vision. I know it. I know it before the consumer knows it. They don't know what they want until I give it to them. I am like the opposite of that founder. (laughs) I think I am the founder that is like, the only thing I know for sure is what I have is incorrect. But the good news is, is like, I think we need to be humble and we need to like listen and iterate and change. And I have a lot of confidence that we can get better and really get there. But I think we went into launching, assuming like everything is wrong. We haven't been able to sufficiently test it the way that we can on the other side of being right. And that's what I loved about being direct to consumer. There were so many levers to test. There was so much less risk also to putting something up and trying new things. And if it doesn't work, it's okay. Right. And I think that's something that's 
continues with us today, whether it's on site or whether it's on emails, whether it's on social, we very much so have a culture of just testing and not being afraid to fail and, and just really iterating our way to success. And I'm so grateful that, again, this brand was launched in a time and place where that D2C lever was available to us because I think there would be nothing scarier than launching unproven product in like thousands of doors and like physical packaging that we can't take back. And like, there was so much like the assortment, the pricing, the messaging, like everything we launched day one was like absolutely, absolutely wrong. And I think we continue to learn today, like pretty interesting insights that help us get better and, and expand our mission. Yeah, I was asking because I read somewhere that you guys were really, I guess, particular with even the stores that you did want to launch. And so I wanted to know the psychology behind like deciding to launch certain products in certain stores and like the retailers you chose to launch the product in and all that stuff. Oh my God, that's, yeah, it's it's so true. I think we were very fortunate in our first three years, we actually had probably like every dream retailer on our vision board actually reach out to us and want to engage in the conversation. And I think that's where the clarity was helpful for us in terms of like, no, like, we can't go into retail until we know that we're going to be successful in retail and that there's a lot of risk. And, you know, a lot that goes against our mission around striving to be a sustainable company and waste if you don't get it right with physical retail. But we knew that we wanted to go into physical retail at some point. So when you think about the cleaning category, still 80% plus of consumers want to do pick up their cleaning products where they're doing their weekly, bi-weekly, more general shopping trip. But with retailers, we want to go into like we decided that container store was a really interesting place to start. We liked that it had just 90 doors, which was a very manageable set of doors that we can wrap our arms around. You know, a lot of the retailers that most consumers shop most often have like 2,000 plus doors that you're in versus 90 felt like we could get to know the locations. It was a smaller retailer that we could also work with to do some more explicit testing. It's one where their store employees get rave reviews. They're very engaged. So we could also work with them to make sure, you know, how our products are presented in stores were sort of how we we wanted them to be. And so we kind of viewed container store as a great way to like dip our toes into the first time we do retail packaging and have it out in the wild. And we were pretty confident that whatever we launched there, we were going to want to iterate on before we were ready to like bring it into more doors. And something I did want to ask really quickly, when we were talking about water and your product and like using it in different water qualities, because like in New York, you know, everyone's like, oh my gosh, best tap water. But like when I'm down in Florida, I've never had the tap water there. Like my parents are bottled water people. And so I was just thinking about when someone is like in a place or a city where it's like the tap water question mark, how does your product work in those type of tap waters? Is there some type of cleaning element in it or how does it respond to different water types? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I love the question because it's not a question we get often and I wish we got it more often because we spend a lot of time thinking and optimizing for different water qualities, whether it's, you know, hard water, soft water is a big one. But also like cleanliness of water, which again, unfortunately, really varies across the U.S. We rigorously test all of our products, also against leading third-party brands at independent labs in a range of water scenarios because there are things that we can do to the formula absolutely to optimize for different types of water. It also includes water temperature is another big one for us. So when you think about like laundry, we're a brand that really encourages people to do the cold water wash. We're a big believer that with the right formulation like ours, cold water can be just as effective as warm or hot water. But then what cold water means if you live in Alaska in the dead of winter, it's extremely cold. And when you think about our tablets, like that tablet needs to be Hard enough so it doesn't crumble when we ship it to you, but soft enough that in a cold water wash, it dissolves in a matter of minutes. And so like water temperature is another one that we've had to just be very mindful of and make sure that we're optimizing for sort of range of temperatures as well. How do you address that? Do you have kind of like regional mixes that you do, or do you have one that tries to run the gamut? For example, where I am in Massachusetts, it's summer now, water temperature coming out of the cold, the quote unquote tap, is actually kind of warm. But then if you, six months from now, it's going to be completely different. Yeah. So we have like, a, we test for a range of temperatures as well as range of like hard water and soft water, as well as again, a, a range of essentially cleanliness and different sediments or other contaminants that might be in the water. So one product then for everybody. Yeah. One product for everybody. Yeah. Cool. 
And I definitely want to talk a little bit about your personal journey because you are so deep in this industry, but you actually start out in investment banking, right? Oh my God. Yes. I started out in investment banking. Uh, those were, I did two summer internships in investment banking. I didn't ultimately do my first full time. I think after two summers, I was like, I got it. I got it. It's not for me. I mean, kudos to the people that can hang on, but it, it, it just was for many reasons, not for me. But I did start off with a very traditional background in investment banking summers. And then I was in consulting and management consulting at McKinsey for two years and then went back to finance and private equity. So on the investing side for two years. And I think, you know, grateful for the set of experiences that I had. I think it did establish a really strong business and finance foundation, which I have really been able to use in launching Blue Land. I think that said for me, I, I think those years, again, I feel like it was kind of like the grasping around the dark. I was trying to like, you know, it, it felt like where I was supposed to be from like society standards of like success and, you know, being someone that's in business, but it just, it never quite clicked for me. And in, in terms of like, it just, it never got me excited. And I think especially that investment banking experience really opened my eyes to like, wow, we can spend so many of our waking hours of our lives working. And, you know, I think that really highlighted for me, like I just, I needed to find purpose, but even joy in the work that I was doing. It just like life was too short to just spend it in that way when I just, I wasn't enjoying the work. And so I really tried. I mean, I, I gave it a go in sort of those types of industries for many years before I decided that I had to close the door to that chapter of my life. Looking back, would you say that the entrepreneurial bug was always there? Or did it kind of evolve over time? So the entrepreneurial bug was definitely not always there. I grew up quite square. You know, my parents both immigrated here. My dad from Thailand, my mom from Korea. And I, I think I grew up with very sort of traditional notions of like what success was supposed to look like. And I think you can still see it in some of my stories today about Blue Land. I do think I was an unlikely entrepreneur from that. Kid. Literally the idea of starting a company had never crossed my mind until my late 20s. And I think that was a pivotal moment. Another square thing I did was after finance and consulting, I went to business school because I still didn't know what I wanted to do, but it felt like a safe place to like land and kind of get credit for getting an MBA where I like then could try to like figure out what it was that I want to do. And huge credit to business school, not because of the curriculum, but I went to business school and timing it oftentimes is everything. Like, so I went to Harvard Business School at a time where some people may remember this sort of period, but like Guild Group, Rent the Runway, Birch Box, Bobble Bar. Stitch Fix, you know, were all businesses that actually came female founders out of HBS that had backgrounds like myself, like had no prior background that would lead you to believe that they could start a company in the consumer space. And they were just going out and doing it. And I think it was really inspiring to hear, like, for example, the Rent the Runway founders share how they went about starting it. And it really just demystified it. It's like they had this idea, they bought a bunch of dresses, they loaned them out to women in sororities, and then they dry cleaned them over and over again to see how long they would last. And then they like shared the idea with the VC firm and the VC firm gave them like $2 million. And I was like, oh, okay, like I can do that. And so in business school, very early on, within the first two months of business school, I decided like, I want to try to start something because I know I'm too risk averse to ever leave a well-paying, stable job to then start something. So I was like, business school is the time that I should try to start something. I never recommend being a person in search of starting a business or starting something for the sake of starting something. That wasn't Blue Land. That was like you know 10 years prior to Blue Land. But that's how I ended up on this sort of entrepreneurial journey. You know, I ended up launching a mobile app out of business school. And that, that's when I started to like sort of get the bug and build the confidence of through a lot of like iteration, trial and error of like, oh, I can do this too. I mean, because technically you had a startup before this. What is something you learned at your past startup where you were like, oh, okay, for my next company, you know, I'm going to do this differently or I learned this or I'm going to do this again? I mean, I think that the biggest and most painful lesson was, you know, it, it's product market fit before the marketing. And I think that's also where a lot of our approach with Blue Land came from. You know, I would say that prior to Blue Land, I helped start a startup studio that had the thesis that in 2013, we were still in the early inning of the shift to direct to consumer. At that point, it was kind of like Warby Parker was the big example. And, you know, we had the belief that we're going to start seeing whole categories from like tampons to socks to like, you know, every niche go direct to consumer. And so we raised this money with a goal of launching one business year. And that's what I then did. I launched four businesses across four years. 
would not recommend that. It was a crazy period, but I did cut my teeth sort of like launching new businesses. I would say with those businesses, we raise a ton. We raise a ton of money. Then I learned firsthand the pressures of like you raise the money at the high valuations and the treadmill starts and now you need to start posting the revenues to warrant that valuation. Then you start pouring money into marketing before you know. And that often hides whether you're onto something or are you growing because you're pouring all this money that we raised from other people. And so I think that absolutely influenced you know, our path to Blue Land where first year we really spent nothing on marketing. For me, it was like, let's get product market fit first. It's also when you're getting started, you're a tiny team. You're like, you know, we have four people on our team. We can't both be marketing at the same time as trying to figure out if we have the right product on our hands. Yeah, that first year was all about iterating and saying like, let's get the pricing right. Let's get the assortment right. Let's get the messaging right. Let's get all of this right before we start like versus like wasting money marketing a product that's not right because that's going to make the difference between, you know, it's going to make that growth so much easier once you have the right product. And we're almost out of time. And so I have maybe two more questions. One, every time I hear about how poisonous things in America are, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, America. And now I just have to ask, does Europe have similar issues like this in terms of the water quality and just, I don't know, the poison in the environment? Or is this something that they're more proactively addressing than we are at the moment? Great question. I actually haven't seen any studies on differences of water quality. I would assume that still like they're going to have a lot of the same kind of microplastics and other exposures only because like the bodies of water ultimately are all connected. But I also wouldn't be surprised to see if the water quality was different because certainly the regulations are different. I think there are much higher standards in Europe for what ingredients and materials are used in products than we have here in the U.S. I am of the belief that there should and it should be more regulation here in the U.S. And I think that big business and lobbies have captured, unfortunately, a lot of the political process and have sort of like undo say. And it, it has been hard to, um, you know, often show up. You know, we do advocacy work mostly at the state and local level. Actually, every time that we've been involved, right, big business has always been on the side against environmental legislation. And we are have always been the largest business voice. And we're still relatively small in the scheme of things. Like we've been the largest business voice in support of a lot of anti-plastic legislation, legislation that would advocate for removing PFAS from like, you know, some of these things feel like no brainer. Like PFAS is a known carcinogen. Like why is it prevalent in food packaging and menstrual products and a range of other, you know, kids' toys, raincoats, et cetera? It, you know, feels like a no-brainer. So it is unfortunate to at least here have that be such a controversial thing and something that big business is so against. And I feel like Tim and I could talk with you all day about this, but we do have to go. And so I guess the final thing is just what's next for you in Blue Land? You know, obviously on the product side, you know, innovation is absolutely a pillar. We're really proud of all the innovation that we've launched in the categories that we are in to date. You know, we'll continue to do that, though I also will stress that we want to be continue to be really mindful about what we're producing and what does the world need from us. You know, you won't see us going into things like we have gotten a lot of requests for like shampoo bars, right? Or But, you know, the world doesn't need another shampoo bar from Blue Land. And so I think we're going to be mindful there and also just cognizant that we're already operating in a lot of really massive, impactful categories. But I think more broadly, you'll start to also see a step in a bigger way into advocacy work. I think it's always been, you know, a passion of mine and my co-founders as we think about more broadly the mission of Blue Land is to eliminate single-use plastic packaging. It's not lost on us that the biggest lever to do that effectively is government and laws and policies. You know, we can try to convince everyone to not use a plastic straw, but probably the most impactful thing to do is just ban a wide range of plastic straws or single-use plastics. And so, yeah, we're excited to grow and, and hopefully play a more influential role in sharing sort of the strong business case that can be made for policy that's good for the environment and human health. Because I think, again, too often policymakers are hearing the other side where like these types of policies are hurting business profits and business growth. And that's like, I think the story of Blue Land and how fast we've been able to grow and profitably is a strong case study that that's absolutely not the case. And there is an incredible business opportunity to really align what's best for the planet and, and humans with the business world.
And that was our conversation with Sarah. Before we begin, Tim, what was the lie? The lie was that the plan was to originally launch in stores, but instead they spent three years direct to consumer. In fact, they had spent three years direct to consumer very intentionally so that they could test out the product. They really found that iteration was important to the company and its development and making sure that by the time they got to brick and mortar stores that they had the right product. Yeah, that's so interesting. But I guess there is a lot of research that comes with doing a product like this. Yeah, I was really stunned by how much effort it took to create tablets of kind of everyday cleaning supplies, soap, stuff like that, right? Like, I'm one of those cheap people that buys refills of regular like liquid hand soap and then dilutes it in my bathroom, kitchen, whatever, to kind of create the foaming hand soap. And you just kind of think, whatever, I'll just pour it in. It'll be no big deal. Mix it up. But I really hadn't thought about all of the chemistry that goes into something like what they're producing, right? They have to get it to dissolve quickly. They have to do that in a range of water quality, water hardness. They have to think about things like sediments that might kind of grab some of the important chemicals and precipitate them out. So they're settling on the bottom instead of remaining suspended. And then I think the other thing that really blew my mind was how they have to worry about ensuring the, I guess, the purity of the product over time, right? Like they don't want any bacteria or anything growing inside of that. And that's not really something that springs to mind when I think about cleaning supplies, right? You kind of assume that it's a toxic to bacteria sterile environment in there. Yeah, I know. I Because like I actually have one of her products and at first I was like, this is a tablet. And then I put it in the water and I was like, okay. But then like I was looking at it and I was like, this looks like just water. And I was like, does this thing work? And then when I like push the hand, like the thing to, to dispense it, it like foamed up just like soap. And I was like, what is this product? Because it just looks like clear water in a container. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this seems like a really big undertaking, like a big feat, like a, like a scientific discovery or something. Yeah. I mean, well, it sounds like that's exactly what happened, right? They had to recruit the right person and they went through formulation after formulation to get this right. And it sounds like something like laundry tablets are even harder, right? Whereas other companies basically package it in these polyvinyl alcohol plastics and rely on that to do the dissolving. They went the harder route to find a binder that was going to dissolve quickly enough within the washing machine so that it would turn into the detergent quickly enough to actually complete a wash cycle. That's actually crazy. I did. I wanted to bring up the Tide Pod challenge so bad, but like, luckily I did. I was like, do not ask about the Tide Pod challenge. She yeah. kind of like hinted towards it because it was a good point. Like what is in this stuff that, you know, of course don't eat laundry detergent, but the fact that if you did, it would immediately like zap you like a bug. Like, what is that? What is in this stuff? I was going around my home yesterday. I was like, what, what is this? Yeah. You know, like what is big about? American, big plastic, big microplastic. It's crazy. Yeah, no, it, it is crazy to think about. There are a lot of different directions that you can go when you think about plastics. My entree to it was I'd read an article years ago about fibers kind of sloughing off rugs and carpets and stuff like that and ending up in infants and kids, you know, who are always kind of playing close to the floor and stuff like that. And I think over the years, you've started to see this kind of dawning awareness in the general public about just kind of like how prevalent micro and nanoplastics are and the hazards that they pose. This is like back in the day in like the 1800s when they were doing ungodly things in medicine. And then like a century later, we look back and we're like, why were we doing what that? What were we thinking? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or another thing where um, when they wanted to make watches that you could read at night, they would actually paint them with radium, a radioactive material, which again, like I'm sure at the time seemed like the future. But, you know, those poor people working in these watch factories, painting it, getting dosed with radiation all day. That is, listen, maybe humans are a product of their time. Because, I mean, look at us now. Like now the microplastics are in our brains and not smart, you know, like because a few years ago, right, cause she, she brought up the whole thing about being biodegradable because that was a whole thing like decades like a few decades ago. It's like, yeah, it's biodegradable. We're fine. You know, you just do that and then you never think about it again. And lo and behold, it turns out like that's that's it's not biodegrading or at least yeah. not in the way we thought. It's kind of an out of sight, out of mind thing, right? We can't see it. So we think it's gone. But in fact, the problem is it's there. It's just smaller and everywhere. And in our waters. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, plastics are not going to go away entirely. But one interesting thing to keep an eye on is you know, one, companies like this that are finding ways to eliminate plastics from places where they're really not needed. And two, 
plastics that actually you can kind of chemically break down into something very benign so that you don't end up with just tiny bits of the same thing, but something that's completely different and I guess not transparent, but like much less harmful to the environment and to ourselves. And I was just, I was upset, but not surprised to hear that the big plastic industry was against, I guess, helping others. <laughs> I don't yeah. know what other phrase to say. Just, it's so stunning because it's like these things, I, I don't know what plastic in our brain will do. It sounds bad, but being against like fixing that is kind of, I don't yeah. know. That's wild. I mean, it's a playbook we've seen run time and again, right? Kind of like ignore the problem, delay it, et cetera. Yeah, it's kind of crazy to see that happen over and over again. I think the other interesting thing that struck me was the fact that when she went to other experts and companies with this idea of let's make pods, whatever, that don't need plastic to contain it, particularly the laundry pods, they were like, well, this just can't be done, right? I know. I was like, what do you mean it just can't be? How do you know? Yeah, Try. I think it kind of shows like this, people get in ruts, right? And they assume that there's a certain way to do things and they, they stumbled upon polyvinyl alcohol and it seemed like the solution and there didn't seem to be much motivation to move beyond that. I mean, I mean, once again, I guess I'm looking to see what Europe is going to do because it seems like if any type of regulation comes out, it's probably going to, the EU is going to get it first. Yeah, the EU takes a very different approach to regulation than the US, right? They operate generally, not always, but on the precautionary principle where they're looking at something first, analyzing it, and then green lighting it, whereas we tend to assume everything's going to be okay, and then after there are problems, go back and try to fix it. That's the American optimism. I remember when I was in, like, elementary school or something, and they said that we allow a percentage of bugs in our food, and it scared me so much that I, I at the time, I was, like, eating a honey bun, and I didn't eat honey buns for years, because I don't know, as a kid, I was like, it's just in the honey buns, but then, because it was just so freaky, like, why would you let bugs in our food? I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think about that when I'm eating my rice checks in the morning and I see a little brown streak. I'm like, is that part of the rice or is that Probably something else? Probably a bug. Like, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, and this whole conversation has me thinking about whoever, like the, the person who invented plastic, I wonder how they feel right now. Yeah. Who I are mean, you? That's t happened a long time ago. I'm sure they're long since deceased. You know, I think there are still a lot of good things that come out of plastics, obviously, right? Like healthcare basically runs on it and there are other things. But I think, of course, the danger is that we've kind of taken it to its extreme. Yeah, you said healthcare runs on plastic. <laughs> yeah, I hope to see more companies like this tackling because I think we had Caraway, I believe, with the pots and the pans that are addressing all of, I guess, like Teflon poisoning and all the poisons PFAS, yeah. on our pans and stuff. So it's good to see kind of these newer age companies from the past few years pop up and address these very critical issues. I mean, that's an exciting part, I guess, of, of innovation. Yeah, and I think it's hopeful, too, that a lot of this seems to be driven by consumers themselves and their motivations, right? It's not necessarily regulation, but it's consumers going out there and saying, you know, we want stuff without plastics, we want stuff without PFAS. You know, you saw it with BPA back in the day with plastics. And I think you see companies kind of trying to adapt to that. Some do it better than others. And so I think it's also neat to see a lot of startups kind of coming up and taking advantage of this gap in the market that the large companies are failing to address. And then like in one small note, I love how she spoke about going to Harvard Business School and seeing all the women that were coming out at the time, because I feel like that was such like a poignant moment, I guess, in Silicon Valley with all these women that just popped out with startups and all these things. So it was cool to see her mention that and say like, yeah, you know, that also inspired me to get up and get out there. Yeah, I think it's nice because it again shows that there are parts of the market that are obviously going unaddressed, right? And it takes different perspectives for people to find those markets and help find those consumers and connect them. And this is terrible, and I know we're running out of time, but I did want to ask what would happen if someone ate the laundry pod just to see, you know, because the Tide Pod Challenge. Yes. And she was saying it's so poisonous. And so not saying like— I don't think you'd want to eat any laundry detergent, okay. to be honest. Okay, no, I'm just, you know. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of the science behind how you get stuff clean requires— chemicals that you generally don't want to eat, right? Like way, no, way, yeah, way back fair. in the day when we used to wash clothes in rivers, we used lye and like you do not want to eat lye. That's, a, you know, it's the opposite of drinking acid, but the effect to your insides is about the same. Humans evolve. Yeah. My generation flopped with that. Like that in the cinnamon challenge, that was... Oh yeah, I remember we that. Were, we were down bad for <laughs> a, a mile. 
Found is hosted by myself, TechCrunch senior reporter Becca Skutak, alongside senior reporter Dominic Midori Davis. Found is produced by Maggie Stamitz with editing by Kel. Our illustrator is Bryce Durbin. Found's audience development and social media is managed by Morgan Little, Alyssa Stringer, and Natalie Kreisman. TechCrunch's audio products are managed by Henry Pickovit. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back next week. Music